If you want to help Myth Vision Podcast grow, you can join our Patreon. There are different tiers as well as help out with PayPal. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Derek Lamb. Welcome back. You're going to want to stay tuned for the next 12 episodes, at least 12. We're not saying we're going to be as funny as South Park when it comes to this, but I would like to come close. In these episodes, you're going to hear the background, the details of this man named Joseph Smith and the Mormon Church. David Fitzgerald, author of The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion and the Mormons, and many other books, of course, go down in the description. Make sure you guys show them some love. All the links are down there. Become a patron, you know, throw them your change, help out because this is what they do. And Bryce Blankenagel, hope I said that right, is a Mormon. Yeah, you got it. Nice it on. Is a Mormon history communicator. He hosts Naked Mormonism podcast, among others, and serves on the John Whitmer Historical Association Article Awards Committee and has given numerous presentations on all things Mormon history. And with that being said, gentlemen, ladies, please go down in the description, show him some love in any way you can help participate because we're going to keep bringing the heat. With that, welcome. Great to be here. It's like we never looked I know, right? (laughs) Inside little occult secrets that we carry. Um, Let's go ahead and get right into this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Bryce is a third degree, working on his fourth degree black belt in Mormonism, and <laughs> I'm 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 a white belt man. Now you got to teach me the ins and outs, and so I need to learn. And we're going to have you start us off here. We're going to be going into the the history behind where this all takes place and leading up to the first vision of Joseph Smith, I believe. Yeah, it might be helpful to kind of lay a roadmap, a general overview of Mormon history uh, before we kind of dive into, you know, get lost in the weeds, because we're going to be doing that today <laughs> <laughs> with uh, with me, the insufferable windbag, and with David, who is uh, pithy and quick and, and knows Mormon history more than a lot of people do. We're going to get lost in the weeds. So Derek, you're going to be responsible for kind of reeling us back in, throwing us a life raft and getting us back on the track. So Kind of a general overview, Mormon history happens in basically four central localities, and they all and it all centers around this this figure who created it, Joseph Smith. These localities are New York, where the early life of Joseph Smith comes into play, where he gets his reputation as a seer and a, a practitioner of magic, and he propagates the story about these this ancient gold Bible, and he publishes the Book of Mormon. And eventually is basically chased out of New York, uh, where he relocates to Ohio. And Ohio is where he begins to build his cult of personality and begins to uh, expand his theology and expand into, um, you know, creating unique and uh, proprietary uh, beliefs within his framework and give hundreds of revelations that he distributed through a vast network of propaganda machines. Uh, he was very hot on this concept of the printing press. Uh, if, you know, Joe would be a very well followed tweeter today if he existed. Um, <laughs> eventually he's, he runs his church into bankruptcy and he's chased out of, of Ohio and he removes to Missouri. And he spends a year there at the larger Mormon settlement there in Missouri. Uh, and he commits war against the state of Missouri and, And he is arrested and his people are chased out of Missouri, where he removes to Illinois, where he is able to realize all of his plans of a grand empire building in his fiefdom, his kingdom on the Mississippi that's known as Nauvoo, Illinois. And that is where he is assassinated while he is running for president of the United States in 18. Trajectory of 39 years, we see the, the truly the American dream of somebody who goes from living in rags to acquiring vast amounts of wealth, tens of thousands of followers, and builds an entire career off of lies and propaganda and aspires to become president of the United States, overthrow the government and instill a Mormon empire via this revolution. 
And this revolution is to build a Zion, the new Jerusalem, which will be the government, the temporal government that is built on the American continent upon which Jesus will reign after the second coming. They create the temporal, that, that kingdom. Exactly. And let's pause for a second to take that in, because when we think of Joseph Smith, we think of this nice upstate, uh, upstanding guy who just reads his gold plates. But you've got a different picture of this that most of us have no idea uh, was a part of his story. How, just how high that trajectory took him. Um, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a, a couple pictures of him in his early stage and then him uh, before his death, before, how high did he go? Hmm. Right. And what so, were his, what were his, his ultimate ambitions? Mormons are taught about this Joseph Smith, right? This is the Joseph Smith we see. This is the portrait that a lot of people see. He's this, you know, young man, and he's studiously, you know, translating his gold plates. This is this ancient record, written by. Oh, let me get this straight. <laughs> Native American Jews that migrated to America in wooden submarines. 2,500 years before Christ. And, and then we're white. also, and we're, and we're white, we're white and delightsome. Yep. And they wrote their history in reformed Egyptian, which isn't a real thing. Right. right. This is the Joseph Smith that we all see, but I don't like this picture of him very much because it's fake. It's propaganda. <laughs> this is, this is fake history, right? He reminds me of a young Lee Strobel, the way people want <laughs> Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel wants people to picture Lee Strobel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so that's the Joseph Smith we see, but uh, there's another picture of Joseph Smith that I find far more fascinating that I believe really captures uh, the trajectory of the prophet, priest, and king of the world. And that is this picture. And I, if, if the viewers will indulge us a little bit, I want to tease apart a couple elements of this because this, this is titled The Last Public Address of Lieutenant General Joseph Smith. And what we have here in this picture is his final address in Nauvoo, Illinois, before he was assassinated uh, in a gunfight. And in, you know, if I know the, the mouse is not that great on the screen, but it, I, I got to tease apart each of these elements, right? So up here on the hill of Nauvoo, we have the Nauvoo temple and Joseph built multiple temples throughout his life and did so by running the Mormons into incredible <laughs> amounts of debt and then declaring bankruptcy and uh, all sorts of bad things happened because he was building these temples. Um, and they, they, all of the, the two temples that he was able to build were the largest buildings in the localities. They stood out, they were built on top of hills, uh, and they were, uh, they were appealing to travelers. You know, what is this building? Oh, that's the Mormon temple. Oh, tell me more about that, right? But also here in the midground of the painting, we have all of these soldiers, right? This is Joseph Smith's Nauvoo Legion, his own private militia which was larger than any state militia at the time. And it rivaled the size of the entire federal armed forces at the time. Think about that for a minute. Yep. He's a religiously, now, like we can't, there, there is no analog to this today, but he is a religious leader with a militia that rivals the size of the federal armed forces. Yeah. That, that, we can't imagine what, what that was like <laughs> to his contemporaries. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Like, how come we never hear this? I mean, ever. Like, is it, <laughs> I don't get it. Is there, is there like uh, money being put out to prevent this history from being known? I mean, this is just, why is this not discussed? Because this blows me away. Yeah. Right. Well, there are even more elements within this painting that I think are important to tease out. And these, we have this Nauvoo Legion in the background here, and then we have all of these Mormons, you know, they're funneling out of this printing house or the schoolhouse here. Children and babies, this little baby right here has holding a trumpet here, uh, you know, to blow the trumpet, and break the seals. Um, and we also have these three men right here, right? We see these three men on their horses. These three men were constables, that were on direct orders from the governor of Illinois, Governor Thomas Ford, to arrest Joseph Smith on charges of inciting riot and treason. They, they were there to arrest him, and he gave this speech on this makeshift lattice that was built near the temple uh, grounds. 
right? They were there to arrest him. him. Who's up there on the stage with him, right? So here behind him, we have his older brother. This is Hiram Smith. He is, we consider him kind of an inferior figure. So Joseph's right-hand man, his, his closest assistant, uh, you know, definitely has just as much as Joseph interested in building this Mormon empire. The, the powers that be, that's a quote, the powers that be uh, to instate this Mormon empire and, and see what this Mormon revolution would be. Here we have uh, Joseph's personal assistant and scribe, William Clayton. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll talk about William Clayton eventually, uh, but that's just a fun name to keep in mind, William Clayton. Um, and then I'm not sure who this is uh, supposed to portray, uh, but we have here Joseph Smith. And this is not the Joseph Smith dressed in rags, studying his gold plates and dictating to Oliver Cowdery what is said on the plates from the Reformed Egyptian, translating it into ye olde English. No, this is Joseph Smith in full military regalia. This is Lieutenant General Joseph Smith with his, uh, you know, his receding hairline and slightly rotund form with his sword pointed to the sky. And during the speech, he said that he would not sheathe his sword until the stone rolls forth and fills the whole kingdom um you know talking about this mormon revolution right he would not rest until he overthrows the government and creates mormon america a mormon american empire and that's not even an exaggeration he literally wants to become the president slash high priest slash king of america and he had the army to do it that's he had the army to do it and notably right here this guy william clayton uh you know we'll talk more about him uh when Joseph was being eventually gave himself up to these three guys to be arrested, he told this guy, William Clayton to burn or bury the minutes of the council of 50, which was his governmental body that he created with its own constitution that would replace the three branches of American government. So oh, this oh. guy was responsible for uh, taking those minutes and, and for keeping all of the records of the council of 50, as well as the council of 50 constitution. Joseph Smith knew how treasonous that document was and told William Clayton to burn or bury the minutes before he died. Before, before there were shred machines, there were fireplaces. Oh, before we That's leave right. that picture, I just wanted to point out in the, uh, <clears throat> in the corner there on the stage, can we take a look at that real fast? Yeah. Even more worrying, he also had a sorting hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hear a lot about that from Mormon missionaries. But. Yeah, Joseph is definitely Slytherin. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have yeah. to stop everybody here for a moment that are watching us. And I want you to take, just like I am, I'm ignorant on this topic, but I know enough from what they've mentioned in terms of broad stroke. You're literally going to get naked Mormonism here. And that's literally <laughs> what Bryce's whole channel is. It's yeah. naked Mormonism. So you're going to see the Mormon church. Joseph Smith, his following, their teachings, the secret teachings, stuff that you will not find anywhere else unless you really go digging. Um, you're going to find that on this series, and you're going to find that by listening to Bryce and listening to Mr. Fitzgerald here. I'm going to be kind of a uh, poke in once in a while to just go, huh? What? You know, and maybe I have questions, but guys, collect your questions. If we don't cover it in this series, We'll do a live at the end or do something special for you guys. And uh, with that being said, please continue, Bryce. I just had to let them know, like, they're going to see <clears> – I never even knew this. I mean, holy crap. He was trying to take over the United States. Who, who knows this, you know? So there's a lot more here. You're going to be blown away. Hey, Bryce, can we go back a little bit and just set the stage for what led to Joseph Smith? Certainly. And I, I want listeners to know that we're, you know, we're going to do our due diligence here to, to uh, and I say listeners because I'm a podcaster, right? The viewers, <laughs> my mistake. I, I want you all to understand that like, you know, a 12 part series on Joseph Smith and early Mormonism. Are you serious? How are you even going to find material to fill that? Um, by the, by the end of this, right? Yeah. This, this guy, he is an absolute fascist and he went to jail and was assassinated in jail because he destroyed a rival printing press that published an expose on his his vast overreach of government powers on polygamy on many other aspects of his criminal kingdom and uh, he destroyed that press and had to go to jail for it gave himself yeah. up um at that time though he was working with you know browning guns 
um that that same browning that that started browning arms company well his dad was a gunsmith uh was a mormon and he was building guns for this mormon empire um he was working with an inventor who had plans to build a a battery and steam powered submarine that you could equip with a flamethrower in order to overthrow the british empire because british superiority was naval based right yeah um this guy, like, he is an absolute monster. And he carries so many lessons of what populism and what uh, a religious cult of personality can do and the power that it wields and the dangers inherent within that. And luckily enough, like, we, we can study all of world religions and they're all ancient, right? We don't have the founding documents. We don't have the court documents of Jesus getting convicted to, to uh, you know, to, to be uh, uh, crucified, right? Like yeah. we don't have those documents of other religions. We do with Mormonism. So Which, we can see the trajectory of a religious demagogue from rags to riches, capturing that American dream of I'm going to, build and build and build and consume everything until there is nobody on the planet that isn't a Mormon. We're not running out of material anytime soon. In fact, if they made an HBO series out of this, not only would it go on for years, but it would have enough sex and violence to keep everybody happy uh, for a long <laughs> Probably time. drugs too. I'm, yeah, I'm not even kidding that. Well, but take, let's, again, take let's, us, yeah, take us yeah let's go back to the very beginning before Joseph Smith was Joseph Smith, when he was just humble Joe Smith living in upstate New York in the burned out district. Let's, yeah, well, David, can you give us a bit of a, you know, a brief overview of the burned over district? Because that yeah. in and of itself is going to set the stage for us a lot today. Right. So what we call the burned over district <clears throat> was a time and a place, uh, upstate New York uh, um, in the 1820s or so, where it was just one religious movement after another. Like wildfire would come in, sweep over the whole district, and then burn itself out until the next religious movement came in and burned itself out. And it was the birthplace and the cradle of all these religions, not just Mormonism, but the Millerites who became the Jehovah's Witnesses um, and the, the Adventists, um, um, the Shakers, the Quakers, and all these uh, bizarre, obscure little um, hippie cults and, and apocalyptic cults and religious movements and, and utopian movements that we, uh, never heard of before, but all of them came out of this this one time and place. Um, so on the one hand, you had this this new religious revival that they like, called the Great Awakening, um, and on the other end, folklore world of folk magic. And this was the same generation that gave us uh, Rip Van Winkle and Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman. Um, that post Revolutionary War. Uh, when this was happening, there were still founding fathers alive, uh, like Thomas Jefferson, like James John Adams. Um, they had had a war with Britain, was like the second American Civil War. Um, they'd gotten the Louisiana Purchase, and now the country was twice as big as it had been just a few years ago. So this is a time when America is this baby country that's really starting to grow by leaps and bounds, and the religious imagination and the folklore um, combined to make all these incredible religious movements. Um, and that's something we wanted to get into is just talking about the magical worldview that permeated this time. Let's also uh, do a, a little bit of time with the disappearing Indians as well, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. um, epidemiology wasn't generally understood at the time. Um, it, it was you know, the curse or the scourge of God or whatever, right? Smallpox um, had nothing to do with it. It was all God. Exactly, yeah. exactly, right. So th there are these, as uh, white European settlers were moving further and further west and pushing more and more native troops, uh, troops, tribes out of their native lands, um, A, that presented some moral questions for the people who were doing those things. They needed to rationalize and justify what, what was going on and why they were encountering these people and these people are trying to kill them and, you know, why these people who are, you know, these savage Indians who are so uncivilized 
are leaving behind these huge cities and these yeah. mounds and and all of yeah. these massive and incredible artifacts and amazing technology they needed to understand who was responsible for building all of these things because right. these savage indians that we are killing and that are trying to kill us back couldn't well, possibly it wasn't be responsible them. for this no. Yeah, Clearly absolutely. Not. Absolutely. So, so various uh, the theories propounded uh, of how who was actually responsible for building all of these civilizations and these mounds and these cities and these ruins that they were encountering, um, not understanding that it was due to their own actions that the that European settlers were killing off Native Americans. I mean, millions, millions of Native Americans. I mean, some estimates say as high as 95% of Native Americans, that can be as many as 30 million people died in, beginning in 1500s, the, the late 1500s with the conquistadors, right? Like th this, is, th this is a really tough time and they didn't have our modern scientific and archeological evidence uh, and that entire body of knowledge to understand what was going on, but they were also trying to rationalize their own conduct of genocide, right? So yeah. eventually, you know, various people came up with stories and this is the world in which the Book of Mormon was born, that these enlightened white Jewish people, Christians, came over to America before Christ and built the, the civilizations that, that the Europeans were encountering as they settled further west. And eventually, the more warlike, unenlightened, the darker-skinned Lamanites in the Book of Mormon narrative killed off all of the civilized, white, and delightsome Nephites. And the only ones that were left were the more, you know, the uncivilized Lamanites, the darker-skinned Lamanites. Right. So the, the inherent racism and the, the inherent white supremacy that is built into this worldview is necessary to understand how the Book of Mormon came to be, how Joseph's own beliefs and own white supremacy informed the content of the Book of Mormon, and how much that idea permeated the culture of the time um, and all of the various environmental factors that contributed to creating that worldview. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. So, okay. Uh, yes, I've heard something about Indians in the past in this whole thing. And there's some strange ideas surrounding ancient, a ancient angels and, and then connections with them being the lost tribes and all this interesting stuff. We'll be getting, is this something you think we're going to get into more depth later? This is just some uh, preparation ground going into the time in which this is happening. Um, I know that you mentioned magic. Uh, does this play a part on finding out about who this guy Joseph Smith is? I mean, what's going on? Let's, let's, let's go with Joseph Smith, young Joseph Smith, and then back our way back into the magic. Because uh, first we've got to find out this kid uh, who, who was responsible for giving us uh, Mormonism. Right. Uh, so Joseph Smith was born in Vermont, 1805. He grew up in Vermont, New Hampshire, and in New York. And uh, we're lucky enough that uh, the Salt Lake City-based Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is incredibly wealthy, and they've purchased up all of the land and built replicas of all of these important locations in Joseph Smith's early life. Um, so here we have their reproduction of the Smith family home in New York. This is the Palmyra, Manchester area. Um, and it's, it's a nice little log home, uh, but this is built in, you know, this, this replica that we see here is based on the, the plans that they had of, of common log homes at the time. It's pretty accurate for how it would have looked back then. There were 11 people living in this house. Uh, <laughs> And the Smith family were habitually destitute. They did anything that they could to make money. Uh, and that was, you know, being a hired hand for local farmers. Uh, that was uh, collecting, uh, harvesting molasses and making sugar. Uh, that was uh, a cake and beer shop that they would uh, make cake and beer. And then during the summers, they would uh, wheel it around on carts and sell it to the local townsfolk. Uh, this is, this is the, the world that uh, the Smith family lived in. And this is the little cabin that, that Joseph Smith grew up in. And the, the Smith family themselves were destitute. So um, any means of getting money to pay for anything to, to survive were, you know, were utilized and were implemented in order to support the family. Notably as well, Joseph Sr., uh, Joe's dad, um, was a drunkard. The guy was, uh, he was an alcoholic. Uh, and all of the time, he was out of the way with wine. And that's a quote from him specifically, from himself. Um, he, he spent a lot of time just drinking. 
um, Joe's mom, Lucy, Lucy Max Smith, uh, she was much more given towards uh, Methodism and towards more Orthodox Protestant religions. But um, Joseph Sr. was gifted a copy of Thomas Paine's Age of Reason by Lucy's brother and dad. And he read that and basically was like, all religions are corrupt. Uh, he became a deist or a universalist, not, you know, uni not you, you, like we know today, the atheist church, but, uh, but universalist is in universal salvation for everybody. And all of this while the Smith family were uh, heavily steeped into magic and occult yeah. traditions. Right. And this is going to kind of inform us of uh, the first vision experience because the Smith family, um, let me back up. Uh, magic exists around us today. People believe in magic all the time, right? Uh, people will sleep with crystals under their pillows, or they'll, uh, you know, they'll think that the demon sperm are gonna, you know, <laughs> take over your brain when they're gonna put it in a vaccine because Bill Gates and Anthony oh. Fauci shared a room at what, uh, you know, whatever. With you the lizard that. people, yeah. The lizard people, right? The Bermuda Triangle is all, yeah. <laughs> Bigfoot, it's all there. It's all there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the magic worldview is not something that has ever gone away. It's still very much a part of every day here. <laughs> and it's surrounded, we're surrounded by it, right? Um, that's going to help us understand the Smith magic worldview, right? Because magic that we consider today is magic, the gathering D and D stuff like that. That's not the magic of the 19th century. The magic that they used back then was the occult, the hidden, the secret, right? And that's the, the definition of occult. It's not, um, you know, dyed hair and, you know, seances <laughs> and stuff. Uh, the occult merely means the hidden, something that's hidden, oftentimes hidden in plain sight. So the family, the Smith family practiced these occult traditions, these, this esoteric knowledge. Um, for example, Lucy Mac Smith, she did palm readings. Uh, Joseph Sr., he used divining rods, right? And there are people today who are water witches who walk around with, you know, with sticks and try and, you know, find some, uh, some water on a farmer's land where it's a good place to dig for water, right? Uh, these, these magic traditions exist to this day. Joseph Smith was a seer, so he would use stones, he would use magic stones that were oftentimes bound to him ritually in order to see things that couldn't be perceived otherwise. And 90% of this for the Smith family was using that power to seek out treasure. Treasure, yes, and that's really important. Um, and in order to understand kind of what these treasure digs look like, I want to read a quote from one of the neighbors of the Smiths, a, a friend of the Smiths, Peter Ingersoll, right? He was a good friend of the Smiths. He was a neighbor of them. He helped them, you know, move stuff around, and he was, he was just a good guy, right? Um, he gave an affidavit in 1833, and this is just three years after the church was founded. And it, it gives us a brief illustration of what these treasure digs actually looked like. And we're going to use this kind of a jump off point to discuss more of this magic worldview and how, what evidence we have of the Smith family engaging in these practices. So Peter Ingersoll says, quote, the general employment of the Smith family was digging for money. I had frequent invitations to join the company, but always declined being one of their number, right? So it wasn't just the Smiths themselves. It was an entire uh, treasure digging troop. Um, they used various arguments to induce me to accept of their invitations. I was once plowing near the house of Joseph Smith Sr. about noon. He requested me to walk with him a short distance from his house for the purpose of seeing whether a mineral rod, that's, that's a divining rod, would work in my hand, saying at the time he was confident it would. As my oxen were eating and being myself at leisure, I accepted the invitation. When we arrived near the place at which he thought there was money, he cut a small witch hazel bush and gave me direction how to hold it. He then went off some rods and told me to say to the rod, work to the money, <laughs> which I did in an audible voice. Isn't that just a great quote of, of Mormon history? <laughs> work to the money. Uh, he continues. Wow. Uh, so he says Open. this in an audible voice, right? Yeah. He rebuked me severely for speaking it loud and said it must be spoken in a whisper. This was a rare sport for me. While the old man was standing off some rods, throwing himself into various shapes, I told him the rod did not work. He seemed much surprised at this and said he thought he saw it moved in my hand. And it was now time for me to return to my labor. 
so that that's you know we kind of understand what this looks like right yeah. and what these practices kind of look like and how uh joseph senior was able to induce somebody to get him to join the troop and um it could right. be, you know he could create a ruse that they would find they would discover something magically that was buried under the ground and then that person would be induced to believe that they had discovered it by these magical means and give us a breakdown on some of the the magical incantations and rituals that they had to perform to make it work because this is fascinating to me too right right so part of these these magic traditions are um Magic in general or the occult is basically how the world is moved and shaped in order to be executed uh, within the context of the will of God, right? So God is everything. Everything is God. Everything is moved and shaped by God. But God uses forces. God uses spirits. God uses these things, these, these uh, entities in order to influence the natural world in order to remain mysterious, right? And it's, it's very similar to, you know, like uh, pantheism where everything is, is God and God is everything, right? Um, but also with like God is using uh, forces to lead us towards good ends and the adversary is using forces to lead us towards bad ends. Uh, right. That's the breakdown of white and black magic, of right-hand path and left-hand path magic. And you um, bump into these figures in your normal life in the woods, at the crossroads, you could run into the devil yes. or Jesus at any moment in the shape of a deer or a mouse, yeah. you know, or, <laughs> or uh, and, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, but so, so, for instance, take us on a, a treasure hunting dig. What were some of the things they had to do to, like, hone in on this treasure once, right, right, once right. the seer points his way? Yeah. So, well, I, I'll just say... Um, part of my my research is uh in investigating the use of psychedelics in early mormonism so oftentimes these would be predicated uh on a system of ritualistic washing and anointing um or partaking of a sacrament uh fasting uh getting into the right mindset a uh, system of purity um and joseph smith was known as the virgin scryer of the group and what the scryer did the seer did is they used a magic implement a whether that's a, a divining rod or a stone uh, with sensory deprivation by sticking it in their hat the way Joseph Smith did um, a, in order to see things that are buried underground and they could see things. And, you know, if you're hopped up on psychedelics, you're, you <laughs> might see some buried treasure. You might see a city through a mountain. You might see the magic spirit guardians. You, you might see conjured spirits. You might hear audible hallucinations. You could see and experience all sorts of things that the rest of the group might not. And how did Joseph get involved with this? Did he have a mentor? Did he have a spiritual tradition to draw upon? What can right, right, right. Yeah. That? So uh, let's talk about that in a second. So let's walk through the okay. treasure dig, right? Because sure. like all of these, these, this information <clears throat> is passed through oral traditions and through practicing and through uh, fraternity with other magic practitioners and uh, other occultists, right? Um, and, and Joseph had a few mentors in all of this, but, uh, in, during these treasure digs, you would have to do all sorts of things. And there were a lot of components to the treasure dig. You would have to remain silent, uh, after the spell had begun, you would have to, uh, bury witch hazel or iron rods into the ground in a magic circle. And the seer would then locate where the buried treasure is and point out to the diggers where it is. And then they would put the sticks in the ground in a circle around that. And then they would speak an incantation, a binding spell that would bind the treasure and its guardian to that location, to that magic sigil that's in the ground. And, and you have oftentimes, to do that. you have to do that because otherwise, some pesky ghost or spirit could just steal the treasure, sink it into the ground away. Yeah, from you. the ground gnomes. They're the ground They're gnomes just, are really elusive. Yeah, it's a it's a very difficult science to get this right. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay, right. Okay. And sometimes even I, animal sacrifice too. I got it. Oh, whoa, 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 wait, got it. Animal sacrifice. Let's hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> Go Holy ahead, Derek. Yeah. No, no, no. I, now we're getting to the meat <laughs> of the topic, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and I'm going to interrupt. Uh, let me not, because oh. I'm going to wait. Go ahead and talk okay. about the sacrifice, because this. Yeah, because is... we're getting into we're in total Harry Potter land right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, so this is within the the Israelite tradition of having a scapegoat, right? So the 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 treasure diggers would cast their sins in order for purification into a lamb or into a black dog. 
which would then, uh, during the incantation, whoever is performing the binding spell, they would slit the throat of it and lead it in the circle around the, the magic sigil. And that would basically be one more step or it would be the, the completion of the binding spell that would keep the treasure where it is, where, where it is underground to keep it from sinking further in or to being <laughs> moved to a new location or something like that by yeah. the guardian, the spirit guardians of the treasure. <laughs> And it's interesting to do, uh, to know that one of the rules in Joseph Smith's case was as seer, he could not be allowed to touch a shovel or dig at all. Because if he <laughs> dug or did manual labor of any type, he would lose his abilities forever. So Right, exactly. It was a wow. tough burden on him. Tough burden on him to avoid the, the digging. Okay, okay. Let me poke in here. This is interesting. Uh, my question is, because I was raised a Christian, right? Or at least to some degree I lived as a Christian. I didn't know about magic. Like, it wasn't, that wasn't a thing. I mean, in fact, if you'd have said um, blood magic is a sacrifice from the Old Testament, I wouldn't even know what that meant. But um, where, how did they even, I mean, maybe I'm asking, this goes outside a little bit, but like, was this culturally known in this area? Like somehow did these topics and ideas of magic and practicing such sorcery stuff find its way in? I mean, I know the Puritans had the Salem witch trials, and that's kind of interesting that there was possible real witches, even though when I checked that out, I was like, they're really burning little girls for no reason. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's really good poison. But where did these ideas come from? Like I, as a Christian, never, uh, maybe, I guess you could say, you know, when I burned my uh, Slipknot CDs, when I was trying to <laughs> repent on my sins, you know, they had colors. Like, I'm not kidding you. When I was young, we had a bonfire and I took all my <laughs> heavy metal, my mud vein, my Slipknot and all that stuff. Oh. And I'm like burning these CDs and I'm looking at the colors that came from it. Not thinking those are chemicals that are causing <laughs> yeah, exactly. reactions. I'm like, those are spirits. <laughs> but where did these ideas come from? And yeah. I, I don't want to take too much time up from this because this is good, but. Well, there was a rich tapestry of this kind of folk belief. Um, right. from Europe from and it just came over uh, and uh, if you've ever seen the movie uh, The Witch it does an amazing job of creating a modern day horror story that's based in uh, pilgrim times based on pilgrim accounts uh, it's fascinating Interesting. Really did a really amazing job with it okay well, and I think that the premise of the question is wrong Derek you say where do they come from um, I, the, it's not like they're, they start anywhere. They, they are just captured and they are used and they move these concepts and these esoteric ideas and pursuits more than anything, these pursuits of esoteric knowledge uh, are transmitted among many, many cultures. And with the advent of the printing press, like this stuff exploded in the, in, during the Enlightenment era, right? So there are like the paragons of occult philosophy. Uh, Henry Cornelius Agrippa is, is, you know, he's, you know, born in, I think like the very late 1400s and he wrote his three book occult philosophy in the early 1500s. And this is at a time when uh, Catholicism was losing its iron fisted grasp over the Western empire, uh, over the, not empire, but over the Western world. And people were exploring via the printing press other fields of knowledge because no longer did the Catholic Church have the stranglehold on the word of God because now the Bible was available to everyone. And the, the infusion of these, these beliefs and, and the way that people were not compartmentalizing but meshing together their beliefs in occult practices and biblical teachings – those are not concepts that were ever separated. They were all part of this same magic worldview that people have today. Uh, we, we live in a world where, uh, you know, the satanic panic drove people away from Dungeons and Dragons of face cards and Harry Potter. Um, and those same elements come about through the Orthodox uh, traditionalists um, decrying and, and lamenting how people believe in these magic ideas, but no, they need to believe in the right magic ideas. Uh, but the, the the other people who are you know more esoterically minded, they say you know I a Christian goes to church to read their Bible to learn about God, and I can go into the woods and learn more about God in two hours, and you will your whole life, right? And I say that because that's a quote from Joseph Smith. <laughs> <laughs> That it's I'm it's all sure this same did. belief system, and and Joseph Smith was uh, you know steeped in this idea, and it's understandable too that 
occult practices are looked down on by higher and enlightened and, um, you know, educated society because they're not orthodox. And, you know, at best, these things are a waste of time. Uh, at worst, these are satanic. These are evil. You're meddling with familiar spirits. Um, these things don't Back ever the come day, from anywhere. They, they just right, take on right. slightly different iterations as we move through different cultures. Right. And again, the culture that at the time was permeated with it, soaking in it. So yeah. we got yes. lost in the weeds, gentlemen. A little bit, so a little bit. Let's, let's backtrack because <laughs> I want to ask so many questions, Freemasons, all that, because I heard he was one, but we'll talk about some of this stuff later and you can probably For poke sure. into some of this because the temple itself gives symbolism in a weird way. But, uh, yeah. um, and guys, like I said to the audience, stick around. You're going to want to see what, what we cover because everything from sex, love, hate, crime, death, <laughs> you name it's all in this. It's, it's pretty much a game of Thrones, but here on this show. So uh, yeah, Bryce, keep going. Take us into this yeah. guy. What's going on? Bri Bryce, I'm hoping you can tell us about Joseph Smith's specific um, magical tradition that, that informed him. Yeah. So let's spend a little bit of time with the, uh, the, the, the mentors, right? Because we, we don't have any evidence that Joseph Smith was a bookworm, that he was reading occult uh, philosophy. Cause it's, you know, it's like 600 page, you know, three part book uh, or pseudo Agrippa or even Francis Barrett's, you know, pamphlet. It's a hundred and something pages. We don't have any evidence that Joseph Smith was ever reading anything ever. Uh, he was, he, he didn't care much about books uh, even though he was you know, a pretty prolific author or dictator, <laughs> I guess I should say. Um, but he did have people who were his, uh, essentially his mentor, people who would teach him these things and he would absorb these knowledge, or this, these esoteric fields of knowledge through uh, mentors and through the people with whom he associated. Right. So, you know, just like uh, atheists today who can talk endlessly about passages from the Bible and how horrible and bloodthirsty and sexist and, and racist the Bible is. And they can spend so much time talking about that without ever having actually read the Bible themselves. Uh, I fall into that camp, right? Um, <laughs> people practicing these occult traditions can very much so be, you know, practicing them and know these things and have a passing familiarity and become a pseudo expert on these things without ever having read Agrippa's occult philosophy or Francis Barrett or Ebenezer Sibley or any of these other occult uh, philosophers. Um, but if you wanted to, if you wanted to become, Christ? yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to become <laughs> really steeped in magic, you went to Europe. And gotcha. one of Joseph's magic mentors was named Lumen Walters, which you see his, his gravestone right here, right? Um, this guy was somebody who had magic implements. He had a stuffed toad. Uh, he had divining rods. He had seer stones. And he passed these fields of knowledge down to Joseph Smith. Uh, he also had books that were written in Latin, which <laughs> if you're somebody who believes in a cult and you believe in all of these esoteric traditions and somebody who you admire, as you know, steeped as as an expert in these things, is reading to you in Latin out of a book that doesn't have a title that's you know worn and old, maybe a couple hundred years old. Your your brain is going to melt out of your face. <laughs> He's the real right. deal. That's yes, yeah. street exactly. Cred. Check. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so on Lumen his, Walters on the was one of those. Stone here. I'm looking. That's an apothec uh, apothecary modern pestle. Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, that is, right? Uh, and so that taps even more into my uh, research of uh, psychedelics in early Mormonism because mm. this guy, uh, he was Joseph Smith's magic mentor. Uh, then he joined up with the very early Mormon movement in New York and possibly in Kirtland. And then he left the church and he moved to a little town called Gorham, New York, where he opened up a, an herbal remedy shop. And he was well renowned in the area for making magic tinctures uh, and herbal remedies uh, for all sorts of, of uh, purposes. Um, and if you read in these occult philosophy books, I mean, Agrippa specifically, um, it is filled with herbal remedies of people uh, suffumigating, you know, smoking herbs or partaking of them or using them as a topical ointment. In, in for the purpose of aiding in prophecy and for conjuring spirits and for, you know, things that we call hallucinations, right? Um, sure. But they, they, they are things that, that they would smoke these herbs or partake of these herbs in order to allow them to see the mind and will of God in order to open their spiritual eyes, in order to experience the esoteric and the occult world. And that practice that Smith would do of like putting his face in a hat, that seems just example of this kind of altered states where you <clears throat> cut yourself off from the outside world and focus you know uh what's the word a psychonaut 
A psychonaut. I love a psychonaut. That yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, sensory deprivation, right? You know, Joe Rogan yeah. sits in like a, a, you know, a metal water tank or whatever when he's tripping because uh, yeah. it, it forces your mind to manufacture and to play into uh, spheres where it doesn't have any sensory input. Uh, it, just, it just runs hog wild. Uh, and Joseph Smith depriving his, his sense of sight is, you know, I believe more evidence of him using these altered states of consciousness. Gotcha. And he also um, used magical implements and magical, de like I'm thinking of the seer stone. Uh, right. Um, yes. So the seer stone is definitely a great example. And I, I want listeners or viewers <laughs> to know what we're talking about with this, the magic worldview of the Smith uh, family and Joseph Smith. This is not speculative, right? The, this is not something that is right. like, oh, this was going on in the world around him. Therefore, he must have been uh, steeped in these things. We have artifactual evidence, right? So the church recently published their picture of the seer stone that they have in their own uh, first presidency vault. And I actually have an example of it that kind of looks uh, similar to it. Uh, you can kind of see it here on the video, uh, but it's kind of this brown seer stone with darker brown stripes through it. Um, that was, you know, his Urim and Thummim that he used to locate the gold plates as well as translate the gold plates into English. Um, but there, it was more than that. He also had uh, access to these uh, magic parchments. Mm. And the but magic parchment... Before you, yeah. before you get into the parchments, where did he get his seer stone? Uh, he says, knowing full well where he got the seer stone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he located it by using somebody else's seer stone. <laughs> uh, Sally Chase was a, a seer in, in Manchester area uh, who he was friends with. And he borrowed her a green stone and was like, I see a better seer stone. And <laughs> he couldn't get it out of his head until he found it. digging a well uh, on somebody else's property. And, yeah, on her brother's farm, yes, Willard Chase. Yes, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, seer stones—it's fun, but uh, yeah. and that's some. We have a number of his seer stones, actually, as many as five different seer stones that he used. But we also have what are known as the Smith yeah. family layman. Here we go. And that's what this is. This is a magical parchment that it was used that was given to somebody as basically part of their initiation into some esoteric practices. Um, and this one, like these are terrible scans because these artifacts haven't been uh, opened to researchers for about 40 years now. Uh, so all the pictures are coming from the late 70s, early 80s. And they're digitized, they're terrible, but it's the best we have right now. And Bryce, um, the, if I'm not mistaken, this comes from Michael Quinn's book, uh, on early Mormonism and the, the magical worldview. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And that, that, that is the best resource on all of this, right? Like that, that is Absolutely. the standard pillar of firsthand research that puts, that establishes the magic worldview that we understand. Right. Uh, so and great resource only, not, if you can get through it. <laughs> yeah. It's cause it is a brick of a book and not only that, but there's almost 100 plates just like this. Uh, yes. Of, uh, yeah. And showing the it, connection to Smith directly. Uh, yeah, and he takes uh, pictures from all sorts of magic grimoires from the time, as well as um, these these plates from directories of initiation rites of like the Ephrata cloister, uh, and these these men in like these magical garments, these these uh, special garments that uh, have some Masonic elements to them, but are also gotcha. part of proprietary initiatory rites, which Joseph Smith made his own of. Right. Gotcha. So they're secret societies, basically. We would secret societies, orders, secret and... combinations, one might uh, say. Uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, which is a Book of Mormon term. Um, so this this parchment specifically, this is known as the St. Peter Bind Them Parchment. And this is part of a binding ritual. And, and binding spells are good for all sorts of things. Uh, you can bind things to other things. You can bind treasure to a magic sigil on top of the treasure. You can bind a seer stone to its user. You can bind things in order to whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. And this is known as the St. Peter Bind Them Parchment. And you can see a couple of the magic sigils around here, uh, but on the back of it is notably where you see the actual um, form of the St. Peter Bind Them spell from Francis Barrett's 1805 uh, occult grimoire known as the Magus. Um, and it's specifically taken only from the Magus, uh, as demonstrated by D. Michael Quinn. So we have this occult uh, picture here. Uh, this is the St. Peter buying them, um, layman. This is a much better picture. This is a, a lot more oh, detailed yeah. and you can really see the importance of what is here because there is so much in this one picture right here. 
right? So this is known as the holiness to the Lord parchment for having holiness to the Lord on three of the sides of it. And I believe it says holiness to the Lord in Hebrew on this side right here. Um, but we have all of these magic sigils here, um, as well as this seven pointed star and this little inscription IHS, uh, which uh, Quinn uh, postulates is actually uh, an abbreviation of basically Hiram Smith's um, initiated name, his temple name, basically. Um, which so means again, that, yeah. Well, oh, well, I was going to say, so these aren't even just the current contemporary magical artifacts of the time. These are Smith family artifacts. That's correct. Right. And these, so, these parchments were made for the initiate yeah. by their mentor. Um, and there's there's some numerology built into this uh, this triangle right here as well that leads Quinn to believe that it was actually Lumen Walters who made this magic parchment parchment for Hiram Smith um, and these parchments and as well as some seer stones and uh, a, a ceremonial knife that has Agla uh, engraved into it A G L A uh, one of the names of God. Um, it's been retained in the Hiram Smith family collection in a private collection. Um, and D. Michael Quinn was lucky enough in the early 80s to gain access to that collection and photograph all of these things, uh, which you can find in Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. Um, so yeah, that's a brief rundown. About yeah, we have seer, seer stone, the Ermin Thuman, or whatever. <laughs> um, I know that they're, they cast lots in, in the Bible and stuff. Um, and there's kind of like this uh, sovereignty choice type. Let me flip this coin and you know where it lands god is the one who picked that and it's kind of a sign of magic you know it's chance magic type thing uh but it's it's sanctioned it's okay because it's biblical right. it's our orthodox package um does the mormon church try to say oh they aren't seer magic stones like a magician no this is nothing <laughs> different from what you're reading from your bible is this what they're doing with this even though we know that's not the case Shit, that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we, okay. I think it would be fair to say that there is a certain degree of either avoiding the issue altogether, yes. burying it so no one even founds out this is the case. Um, uh, in fact, let's just put, the, put that um, out in the open. For years, this whole career that he had of being a treasure seeker, see, being a seer stone, uh, 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 seer, the church denied this completely. That those are just right. lies of his enemies. And that started with him. It, yeah. And what was that great quote from uh, the the Mormon historian who said that? Well, if that was true, that uh, at this time uh, that would be the end of Mormonism. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, Hugh Nibley. Have, Hugh Nibley. Yeah. Do you have that Hugh Nibley quote because it, it's spot on? Uh, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, but it was something to effect of, to, well, yeah. if, this, if this was going on during these years that he was supposedly preparing himself and purifying himself to be worthy to get the, 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 the plates of God, um, it would be fatal to the Mormon church. Right. And, and he was using that in reference specifically to the 1826 trial where he was what? convicted of being a glass looker, right? Which they, and using the yes. seer stone. Which they denied for the longest time that that trial even happened at all, that that was just yep. lies from his enemies. Until about 10 years after Nibley said that, when somebody did find the original 1926 <laughs> court case um, <laughs> that tells, showed that not only was he put on trial, but he was found guilty of, of, of defrauding these people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and so the narrative, the institutional narrative, um, initially Joseph Smith did his best to distance himself from the magic practices, yeah. um, in his early church, right? In the very earliest days of the church, he did his best to minimize any of the magic, any of the seer stones, any of that stuff. Uh, the concept of the Urim and Thummim that was only known among his very closest acolytes, um, yeah. Eventually, as his church expanded, especially into the Nauvoo era, where he began really capturing and ensconcing these more esoteric practices into his own theology and incorporating them into his own theology more, that's when he began revealing more of the magic practices to a wider group of people and creating the anointed quorum and the endowment ceremony um, and installing a Masonic lodge in Nauvoo. And the, these more esoteric practices began kind of creeping their way back into the church at that time. But prior to that, he had been minimizing their, the, the role of these things. 
Um, and instead just kind of being much more broad about like personal revelation and stuff like that. Uh, as soon as he died, the, the church under Brigham Young did everything possible to squash that shit, to get rid of it as much as possible, to get rid of any magic practices. But many of the people who were leaders in the Utah era church under Brigham Young were people who had joined the church in Joseph's early years, and they were right. magic practitioners themselves. And they, they continued those practices. Um, it wasn't until the very early 20th century that prophets came along. Joseph F. Smith, which is uh, a nephew of Joseph, and Heber J. Grant, that they made this concerted effort to squash out all magic, to remove any historical artifacts that had anything to do with magic, to remove any connections with masonry, to remove all of these esoteric practices, and even to remove the esoteric symbolism on the temples themselves, the new temples that they were building. Uh, so like, there's a concerted effort to distance itself from all of these things. And now apologists uh, and apostles of the church, uh, they are trying to reconcile the seer stone with uh, technology and with the scientific worldview. And we have the apostle Dieter Uchtdorf holding up his iPhone and, and saying, and comparing his iPhone to the seer stone, saying that this is the way that, that God communicates with joseph smith right wow. so there's this <laughs> this vacillation and this this weirdness and the church doesn't know what to do with all this magic stuff yeah. because they also were part of the satanic panic and like occultism is evil and satanic yeah. and sacrificing yeah. kittens it makes and me child. think bryce it really yeah, makes crazy. me think the reason that they did this isn't because they didn't think magic was good or you know part of the practice i mean they probably didn't even frown upon it during joseph smith's day it was all the critics that caused the church to go down a different groove they they if they were being right. true to their beliefs from the start they wouldn't shy away from this this would have been something from the get-go and i think that we will get into polytheism too which is another reason oh, why sure. you know later on oh it's not allowed but these fringe sects say we don't care what the world says i'm having 20 wives uh you know and uh, so, yeah, this me, is interesting. Me, not, not polytheism. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Well, they have that too. I mean, everyone's yeah, a God who has God who has a, yeah. They so had that too. Yeah. This is going to be and, so fun. And <laughs> here's the thing. This, this pattern that we see of the church suddenly getting later embarrassed by all this and trying to bury it or re-spin it, we're going to see that again and again and again in this series because just about every aspect of early Mormonism embarrasses modern Mormonism. Well, with that, I think we need to stick a needle in it because honestly, we can get and we can go and go. Um, I think in our next episode, since this is our first one, on our second episode, we can talk about the vision in detail yeah. and really press into this crazy, uh, definitely yeah. unorthodox uh, <laughs> experience that this man had. And uh, with that, would you guys like to say some closing things before we end this episode? Well, I would just say stay tuned because you, we buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride because we are just getting started. Just getting started. <laughs> uh, I will uh, echo that and say, um, you know, I one of my earliest starts was on Skating Atheist Podcast. And uh, the phrase coined by the host of that show, No Illusions, was fractal bullshit. <laughs> because the more you examine, the closer and, and more ingrained you study these things, uh, the more it's, it's just, it's, it's crazier the deeper you go. Yeah. Um, and, and as an example of this, right, like the seer stone that Joseph Smith had that he used to translate all of these things, right? Like, he used or he found that seer stone by using somebody else's seer stone <laughs> that he then like got while digging a well that he found with that other seer stone and then the person didn't want to give him that seer stone so he stole it from that person <laughs> that is then that same seer stone that he used to discover the plates that he manufactured and then translate the the the, the gold plates which are native american jews that came over to america on wooden submarines writing their histories in reformed Egyptian on gold plates. He used his seer stone to translate that thing. And then, you know, use the yep. seer stone for more revelations throughout the church, right? Like the more that you zoom in on these, these aspects yeah. of Mormon history, the wackier and more fun it gets. And no joke. Yeah. As we were planning this series, uh, David said, I'm worried that there might be a middle, you know, kind of a slog in the middle here. And I'm like, man, and, <laughs> 
there, there is nothing about Mormon history that isn't fun. Is so is uh, I hope and, that viewers stick around for the rest of this series because we're having we're we're prepared to have a lot of fun. And HBO, if you're listening, this is your next Game of Thrones right here. Sex, Can I be on the writing staff? Craziness, sex, violence, craziness, and drugs too. Got it all. Yeah, I, yep. I totally agree with you guys. I think uh, not only that, Joe Rogan should definitely get a hold of both of you guys uh, after this series and say, time to get on. And, and that'll be a plug <laughs> for you, David, to mention mythicism. Uh, that would be interesting, you know, to really talk about some fanatical ideas that people aren't aware of and, and like, whoa, what the heck? Are you kidding me? And so I definitely want to continue the series. If you're watching and you have questions by the time we get done, you can write them down now. I definitely encourage that. If he has not, or the, these gentlemen have not covered your question to some degree, we'll do a live for you. We'll do something fun at the end. And uh, this way you can get your questions answered. You guys can always email them to me, but uh, I won't be taking a look at them until we're done with the series. And there's no telling how long this is going to last. So with that being said, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. Well, I can't wait. Had to be awesome. Don't forget, we are Myth Vision. If you want to help Myth Vision Podcast grow, you can join our Patreon. There are different tiers as well as help out with PayPal. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment.